Thank you, Michael. It, really great to also see all the challenges outside the health sector and the, and the research and the response and everything. And uh, yes, those are key inputs because the decisions usually go through politics, economics, social, and other aspects that we not necessarily see during the operational response, but there are also other levels of, uh, of coordination. So I would um, like for, uh, for all of you, or the four of you, to, um, to give us your comments on the uh, financing, uh, where the financing should be targeted. Uh, and where we can get the most value of that financing, and particularly related with influenza, but also for other other areas of work, and both at the global level and also at the country level. And the other one on the on the IHR and the ongoing review analysis on the IHR, and also other uh, <laughs> opportunities, other agenda topics like the global health security agenda, for example, and of course many others. Uh, aspect. And uh, I will ask uh, Mike to begin with, but the, I, I would like also Mike as the leader of um, the health emergencies program uh, in WHO to give us also his inputs on the global roles and mechanisms in large pandemics, but particularly on COVID-19 and how can we look the future, the near future and also the medium longer term future. Mike, please. That's quite a challenge uh, to, to, to cover, uh, sir, but I, I, will, I will try my best. Um, uh, notwithstanding what the other said, and Michael spoke very uh, uh, well on the economics of vaccination and investing upfront in vaccination capacity, and that's hugely, hugely important now uh, to, to increase production, but also for, for the future. But sometimes uh, we get distracted on the vaccination uh, side of things as well. Uh, in the event of any pandemic uh, being generated, uh, it takes months, and we've seen, even with the, the, the massive uh, collaboration, it can take months and months to develop those vaccines. There are other areas in which we need to have financing uh, to be able to, to detect, to contain, and to mitigate the impacts. And I think uh, maybe from two angles I'll take this. Um, I watched a documentary, a PBS documentary, thank, thank the Lord for PBS, uh, on the, I think it was the building of the Golden Gate Bridge. And I hadn't realized that you have to build a suspension bridge from both sides at the same time and meet in the middle. And sometimes when we have these existential issues in the aftermath of major disasters, we tend to go to one end or the other end. We, we, we come to a paradigm of global solutions that will deliver locally, and then we invest in big global entities, big global things, and we try to push and trickle that down into local action. And that's one side. And on the other side, there are people who say, well, no, it's all about the local. It's all about investing in local capacity. Uh, and, we, you know, the global stuff is not uh, meaningful. And I think we have to avoid getting caught in that this time. We've got to build this bridge from both ends. In my view, global health security, be it from influenza or be it from any threat to global health, is fundamentally based on local health security. Global health security is based on capacitated, empowered local communities, strong public health systems, strong resilient health systems, strong and good governance, the ability to launch uh, uh, investigation, containment and other measures quickly to sustain support to communities and build a response from there. Global health security for me then is a, an emergence uh, quality if you connect those national systems together. We've had this idea and this response, we can't leave anyone behind. You can't leave anyone behind because if you leave a gap in your dam, the water will burst through. That's the reality. It's the weakest point in your system is the critical point of failure. Uh, and in that sense, we have to build bottom up. We have to recognize that global health security is a ridiculous concept unless we build strong local and national systems and connect them in an unbreakable chain of security by delivering the innovation, the services, and the finances that drive that local to national to global response. Um, and I think that's where I think sometimes we get caught in the which side of this equation are you on. Um, and if we apply that to a pandemic of influenza, the next pandemic of influenza uh, will probably start as some kind of 
triple or quadruple re reassortment of animal human origin and may start in the backyard uh, or in a small production plant in which we see an initial emergence of the disease. What happens in the, in the hours and days around that event is actually critical. By the time that has reached population level, we're already the, the horse has bolted. Uh, in my experience, it's communities, uh, epidemics and pandemics begin and end with communities, and they start on a particular place, in a particular context, in a particular environment. And if I'm not incentivized, if I'm a local farmer and I, I look at my chickens dying, I've got two incentives here. My first incentive is to tell someone that's a dangerous thing. I need to know that. I need to know that's a potential problem. And I need to tell someone who will respond and react. If the response and the reaction is to come and kill all my animals and not compensate me, and therefore my children are not going to go to school because that was the money I was using to supplement my subsistence income, then there is no incentive. In fact, there's a direct disincentive to participate in community-based participatory surveillance. And that is where the first uh, errors and the first mistakes are made in any epidemic response. And then they're compounded all the way up through the system until you get to the global architecture. So if we're going to invest in terms of financing, we have to look at end-to-end -end financing. We have to invest in every single point along that chain of risk, along that chain of, uh, of opportunity, uh, and de-risk every single critical node in the development and generation and propagation of a pandemic, all the way from what that farmer knows and is incentivized to do, to what the CEO of a major international company knows and is incentivized to do. And I, Michael and others out there, I think we need to look at the economics of that all the way along that value chain, all the way along. Because sometimes we get too focused on the big global solution uh, and making a big stock, stockpile somewhere. The second thing I would say is that in the first phase of a pandemic, pand uh, epi um, vaccines are never your first line of defense. Your first line of defense is containment, and usually where we're really missing, and I'm sure there are others online who'd like to comment on this, where we really have gaps is in antivirals. Very often the ability to, 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 to respond and have broad spectrum antivirals that you can use to reduce transmission and you can use to reduce the impact of the disease. We have a huge gap in that space on the therapeutic side, both therapeutics to treat the patient and therapeutics to reduce infectiousness. And therefore, I think there's a whole other area there, and the same on diagnostics. So we shouldn't look at innovation purely in the context of vaccines. Um, I do think that this pandemic has tragically and almost horrifically given us an opportunity, because when you look at vectors, vectored vaccines, you look at mRNA and, and nucleic acid vaccines, I mean, these were really just being rolled out in very small uh, initiatives over the last few years. There's been a huge leap forward in that technology now. And the question is, can we, can we, can we harness that, that those new and expanded and scaled up production um, platforms and be better ready for the next one? With regard to um, um, the, the IHR and, and, and the future issues in terms of uh, coordination, again, I think uh, people have asked me in the past, uh, you know, in, in lectures, uh, Dr. Ryan, what are the three most important things when it comes to epidemic containment? And I always reply, three most important things are governance, governance, and governance. The success or not in, in, in epidemic response rarely depends on the individual actions of the scientists. It very often depends on how the systems of public health, the systems of containment, the systems of communication and trust are governed, how they're managed. Uh, in the system, both locally, nationally, and globally. And I do think there's a very active discussion going on right now about accountability, around who is responsible for what, how do we coordinate a global response to these events? Is this, should this be in the hands of a few countries who dominate that discussion because they have big checkbooks? Or is this truly a global endeavor where what happens in the Cook Islands is as important as what happens in Colombia or Croatia or China? This is a moment for this planet to stand back and say, whose voice matters? Is it the voice of the people who sign big checks or is it the voice of the people in the face of climate change, in the face of inequality? And the inequities uh, I've said with this pandemic, sir, you've heard me say it before, all this pandemic has done is ripped away the bandages for some very old wounds in our society that are principally based on inequity, poor governance and many other issues. So I would put 
pandemics up there with climate as a really existential issue for this planet. This defines our civilization in many ways and how we react now. I don't believe, uh, as I said, finally, top-down solutions don't work. They work to support bottom-up solutions. We need bottom-up solutions, but supported by global enterprise. If we can find a way for those two edges of the bridge, ends of the bridge to meet in the middle, then we'll have some success. Too many times in the past, those bridges have been built and have never connected with each other and have never created a sustainable architecture for global preparedness. Thanks, Ciro. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for your comments. And um, Amadou, I would like also to, to uh, answer those two questions. And maybe some of uh, the first comments that you made on uh, medical countermeasures and uh, sharing data info, that I would like you to expand a little bit on that. Amadou, please. Yes, thank you very much, Cyril. And, and uh, really, um, one of the, the, the points I really want to emphasize on what Mike has so eloquently put is really the part that is really done at the local capacities at the, the bottom. That's where I think building those core capacity in terms of IHR is absolutely critical for me. And that's where probably financing would be extremely needed and where actually probably good investment is something that that, that really, because uh, obviously when this starts, you need capacity to be able actually to get it and to contain it at the source. And that's where reinforcing the health system at that level can make a huge difference. And that's what um, GE has been about. That's what actually has been important to review those core capacities that has been extremely important uh, actually to have them and also to be able to use them to leverage in terms of response. So I think this is something that clearly need to be emphasized in putting really resource and building those capacity because when you talk about diagnostic and surveillance, this is usually opportunity of point of entry into the health system and would really trigger all sort of uh, activity that would lead to some major impact at, at the end of the day. Now, coming to the two point that you mentioned that they early said about uh, um, manufacturing and making sure medical countermeasures are available. Um, I strongly believe we've learned a very hard way that uh, moving from scarcity to abundance is something difficult. It can be extremely disruptive when it comes to like a world shortage of, of different activities. And the only way probably we can build that is making sure that we have some sort of uh, distributed capacities from which people can really make sure at the regional or local level, this is available rather than trying to all source from the same sort of activities and same sort of source. Um, in this regard, I think there have been tremendous work that has been done recently on increasing capacity for vaccine manufacturing and also for diagnostics. And the reason why I believe this is important to invest on that is just that making those capacity available could improve the surveillance and could improve the detection and could improve definitely the whole process when it comes to uh, tackling a disease, being prepared and have a real good control of it over time and also building some sort of sustainability. I think that's why it's really, really important to have that available in areas like Africa or an area where you don't have this capacity. Today, if you look at the numbers, Africa is way lagging behind because it can only produce 1% of the total needs, Why it's usually consumed 25% of the vaccine at the global level. We have very few like capacities. We have we are lucky to have one in the institute. I have the privilege to lead where you have a WHO PQ vaccine manufacturing. Expanding that capacities and making it available to the to the whole region is absolutely critical. Now, uh, why this is important not only to manufacture but to find the right business model to improve the access because it's not about putting that into hands. Uh, where it's going to be profitable only to few people. So having that in terms of equity, what Mike was mentioning is critically important. Now coming to the, to the data sharing, the surveillance and the research, this is critically important. I think we need to fund more research. I mean, the demonstration has been very clear. Within a year, we have like vaccine coming as like a proof of ingenuity and how research can solve problems. And I think that's where there is a huge gap in terms of funding and needs, and that's where we need to put that. But the research should be profitable to everybody as public goods and need to have a lot of sharing happening. And there are all these debate today is about these uh, IPs and things, but the most important thing is really to make the knowledge available 
and from all different places, so this can be helpful to everybody. And that's why I think financing can be important and response, uh, research are being part of the response. I'll stop there, Cyril. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. Uh, and also now, Jung Mi on the same two questions, and maybe expand a little bit on the research and development. And uh, we have been talking for some time already on the universal influenza vaccine. And if you can give us some comments around that also, please, Jung Mi. Thank you, Saro. Um, I already mentioned some of the point for the um, uh, pandemic financing. Um, but um, uh, I, I can probably say about uh, the influenza program. We all know influenza program, including surveillance and monitoring. And the GSAID for sharing the sequence data and the uh, pandemic influenza preparedness framework is a good established example and we can learn from this program. But for emerging diseases, we especially need to act quickly uh, and the preparedness for the laboratory testing at the national level, including emergency use authorization, because this was actually the key for my country to be successful at the beginning. And uh, how to quickly scale up the number of testing uh, would be priority. And I also want to mention about the flexibility of emergency uh, fund use, because the reason my country made the contract with vaccine uh, manufacturer relatively late was uh, government didn't have the flexibility in using emergency funds. So that's actually was, there was some uh, limitation. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, the, your second question on IHL revision, the la launching GHSA by uh, US government and creation of GHSA evaluation to greatly helped establishing uh, WHS JEE, however, during the last few years, the uh, U.S.'s role as a leader on GSJC was weakened um, and not much happened during the last few years. And I think GSA can support, can complement the implementation of um, WHS IHL monitoring and evaluation framework. And personally, I believe four components of monitoring and evaluation uh, framework of IHR should be all mandatory. Among four components, currently only uh, annual state party reporting is mandatory. Other three, joint external evaluation, simulation exercise, and after action review are performed on a voluntary basis from the countryside. And I think all those three co voluntary components should be also mandatory, since these will great contribute to strengthening uh, public health emergency preparedness and response capacity in all member states. Um, and regarding your uh, um, question on the R&D, so uh, it is very true, as Mike Ryan also mentioned, that um, the, the R&D for the therapeutics is not really enough. And although my, con my institute, uh, Pasteur Institute Korea, has been involved in a, um, drug repositioning uh, um, for this COVID-19 therapeutics, uh, there are not really novel um, treatment and it was not really ready. Uh, so th I think there are some discussions some um, on the therapeutics uh, R&D uh, by pursuing uh, um, the pan genus, pan uh, family uh, therapeutics uh, screening and develop an, an R&D. Um, uh, so uh, those, I think, uh, and also the, we have to do the, all the, those screening uh, for the known uh, viruses. So, so, so that when next pandemic comes, then we will be probably more close to, to the, uh, the, the product, which can be used for the next uh, pandemic. So that, th those kind of R&D, I think, uh, uh, work, R&D activities are, are, are ongoing in my institute is also involved in, in those efforts. And um, I also want to mention uh, that um, we need to also uh, work closely with the uh, existing initiatives. So, so th there are, I think there is one uh, in initiative I want to mention in, in the Pacific Center for Health Security established by uh, Australian government uh, to support strengthening capacity in health security in Asia Pacific uh, countries. 
I think all these um, capacities, all these initiatives can complement uh, WHO's IHR and, uh, and support implementation of IHR. And also in, in um, Asian region, we do have Asia Pacific strategy for the emerging diseases. So those um, um, other initiatives can also complement the um, WHO's efforts. So um, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Mi. And now we'll ask uh, Michael to comment. And I will, uh, also the two questions, probably the financing one will be uh, more clear for you, but the, uh, I would like to, to add another one, but this is related to, um, to governance, but also to emergencies. Every emergency is political. And when the political levels are taking some decisions and the perception of the, of the of the community has a, a different way and it has a huge impact on how the pandemic is managed, but also on, on the economics and financing or, and the decision-making or everything. So Michael, I would like to your comments also on that. Great, actually, you know, I, let me, uh, I'd like to focus on the questions that, that came in writing because that's, you know, sort of my expertise. Um, the question was where should pandemic financing be targeted to have the most value? And are there particular aspects related to influenza that need to be accounted for? Those are you know, the second one. I, I'm obviously out of my expertise, but I'd, I'd like to hazard so, uh, something. Um, let me first note that I very much agree with, with Mike that you know, there are many components to this, diagnostics, therapeutics, um, and you know, my own research is focused on vaccines, so that's what I'm talking about uh, today. But I, I totally agree that uh, we need to think much more broadly. Okay, um, so as I described in my initial remarks, um, governments can sign contracts directly for vaccine manufacturing capacity and could invest much more to accelerate vaccine availability. Um, but at this stage of the pandemic and for future pandemics, I think the single most, most high, this would not be a lot of money, but it would be enormously valuable investment. It's getting to be fairly late in, the pand in this pandemic uh, to address uh, uh, shortages. I think we should still do it uh, through, through trying to bring on more capacity, but it is getting late. Now there's something that we could do that we should have done much earlier. And I think we could do for the flu, um, but uh, that, that we haven't done nearly as much. And again, I think this is because of the gap between the need for this from a social perspective and the need and the potential profits to a private company. You know, in general, the vaccine development system is designed to balance efficacy for individuals and side effects. And that's typically a very reasonable approach, balancing off those two considerations. But we're now in a position where there's a global shortage. And in a situation in which there's a global shortage, there's a third factor that needs to be considered, which is, can we find any way to increase, to speed things up so that we can vaccinate people more quickly. Now, you know, just as an illustration of this, in the 2018 uh, for yellow fever, Brazil, consistent with the advice from the World Health Organization, switched to using one-fifth doses of a yellow fever vaccine. And that accelerated, you know, that could potentially accelerate vaccination by close to a multiple of five. Um, certainly if, if supply constraints rather than delivery constraints are binding. Now for COVID-19, there's promising evidence from phase two clinical trials on the effects of partial doses of mRNA vaccines on immunogenicity. To, um, I think that there'll be an analog for flu as well. The, so to, but starting with COVID-19, you know, if we wanted to gather more information on this, that would be potentially enorm of enormous social value. If we could find out, if we found out that we could get by with half doses, you know, we could almost double capacity uh, overnight. Now, we don't know whether we could do that, but R&D on that, you know, companies were moving very rapidly early on. They, they looked at, they did some work on, on different uh, um, different dosing regimens, but then they had to pick something. And we've seen that first doses first seems to work pretty well. I mean, some exceptions, but for, uh, in some situations, it seems to work pretty well. 
you know, that's, uh, we asked, I've been doing work with, I've done some epidemiological modeling. I'm working with uh, someone with a uh, specialty in that. And, you know, that has saved a lot of lives, being able to move more quickly. Now, the question would be, I think a first step would be to gather more information. Begin with studies that could be done with just a few hundred people in weeks to get some more data on immune response to different doses with different vaccines, potentially against different variants. You know, that's already been done in Belgium for half doses of the Pfizer vaccine, but we should be doing this against multiple, for multiple vaccines, multiple different uh, dosing levels, potentially against multiple different strains. Following that, some jurisdictions, and this would obviously have to be a, a decision by the regulatory authorities in each, each jurisdiction, might decide to go ahead with observational studies as part of vaccine rollouts much as you know, many countries have decided to go with first doses first uh, uh, without, you know, without having a full-scale phase three trial uh, showing, the, showing the impact on that. It would be important to, to do that in a setting where one could get good data on, on effectiveness. And that could be countries with healthcare systems that allow you know, rapid uh, compilation of the data, or it could be you know, I'm thinking as, a, as somebody who teaches in a U.S. university, you know, universities uh, could, could do this in the U.S. But um, um, the, um, if, if, that, if that is something that, um, if, you know, we've been, I've been working with colleagues on estimating the potential impact of dose stretching policies. And we find that even if there was some loss in efficacy, and it's not clear that there would be a loss in efficacy, but if we compare to a baseline case of a full dose that's 95% effective, um, switching to a half dose could avert you know, a quarter of deaths, even if it were only 70% effective. So just the, the ep epidemiological benefits, the public health benefits of accelerating the speed of rollout could make up for some loss in efficacy. Obviously there are ethical issues that would have to be thought through, but this would actually I, I, um, this is something that countries are doing the equivalent of. They're deciding to right now to use, uh, and as they should be, to use 70% effective vaccines that are available now rather than 95% effective vaccines. If you could get double the supply, um, but again, let me emphasize, it might not be a drop to 70%. We need to do uh, some testing. It might be that you would have virtually no drop at all. So I think the the high this would not be very expensive. I think uh, you know uh, you know some of the people in this uh, in this group could potentially uh, come up with a, at least the financing for the initial uh, investment in these small trials of a few hundred people um, to just get at the immune response. Um, I think that if I think about the particular case of influenza, my understanding is that there's you know, some evidence that a reduced dose of an intramuscular shot or, or switching to intradermal injection could both be effective forms of dose stretching for flu vaccines. And you know, my understanding is that intradermal uh, microinjections require about half the dose of a standard int intramuscular shot. So if that, if that, I think doing much more research on this could be extremely good investment because if we do, look, we would all love to see, uh, I would certainly love to see capacity built out for the, for the whole world at a level sufficient that everybody could get, you know, if this does, if you can't do these, uh, these doses, that, that, these half doses, but we have to be realistic. What, you know, it's, as Mike said, you know, getting the governance right is very tough. And it's not clear, particularly as we look what's going to happen three years from now, that we're going to get the sustained investment in capacity that, that the world needs. So complementing investment in capacity with the R&D to see if we can get by with lower doses is, I think, a, a really uh, very high return investment for society. If it doesn't work, you know, we abandon it. If it does work, you know, the payoff could be could be immense. So it seems worth uh, stepping, starting the, down the road to researching this. Um, and and in the case of COVID nineteen, I think this could potentially be done quickly enough to uh, to affect the course of the pandemic for for the, those many countries that have not already uh, have adequate supplies of vaccine. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for all your comments. Uh, Amadou had to leave because he had an urgent urgency, so 
uh, I would like to, to continue with two questions that we received through, through the, the internal chat. One of them is uh, relating, the point has been made uh, regarding the vaccine manufacturing capacity uh, should be regionalized. Uh, and I would like to, to add something, not only vaccine manufacturing, but also essential and critical uh, medicines, equipment, and supplies, the capacity to manufacture in those. But what is the guarantee that the regional country with such capacity will not impose embargoes when confronted with a severe pandemic in their borders, or even when the supplies, the vaccines, the equipment passes through their territories as a, uh, in, in terms of uh, reaching their destination. And there is another, an, another question for, uh, for Michael Kremer. Can you talk more about who would make the investment in capacity? Who would reap the benefits and how to address the gap uh, in uh, WHO on who experiences the cost and benefits. Okay, uh, I will repeat that question, Michael, afterwards. But for the first point, uh, uh, Mike and 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 Young Me, please. Um, no, just very briefly. I mean, you you know, sir, I, I I the closer uh, a mechanism is to the to the states and the populations that benefit, the more adapted that is to the needs, the more integrated that, that is to the regional culture, the regional political and economic alliances. Uh, we've seen that with the AppSet strategy, which has done a lot of work. And I think, uh, Yumi, you mentioned the AppSet strategy. Uh, and there is a reason why maybe the responses in, 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 in Asia and Western Pacific were, were quite joined up because there's been a lot of work going on for years to really look at the impact of respiratory pathogens right from community level up. Not a huge amount of money, but a lot of cohesion between the countries around collective arrangements for preparedness, collective arrangements for response, open communication. So I do think uh, there are huge values in linking uh, initiatives and preparedness to economic integration, organizations, political alliances, but you're right, Cyril. The problem arises then where you put something somewhere uh, and therefore that in itself becomes a hub and that hub now is needed to be able to share resources with everybody else, whether that's a manufacturing hub or a logistics hub. The minute you phys physically locate something somewhere, it becomes a resource for a region, but it's based within a country. And therefore, there are real issues to work out in advance. If we're having global or regional mechanisms, the rules of engagement have to be established before. They have to be gained and they have to be exercised and they have to be enforced. Because you cannot have a situation where a country is maintaining a resource on behalf of a whole region and then continues to hoard that resource because of political, local political realities at any moment in an epidemic. It's very tough and it's a very and I think it actually protects the host country so that there's a protection in being able to say to your own population, we're sorry, but this resource is for the region. And I think this has caused a lot of difficulties in this response. Uh, for many. So I think rules of the game uh, and clear alignment with the political infrastructure at regional level so that this kind of mechanisms are backed up and committed to at the highest political level. Back to you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, we have an experience in, in the region. The, the workhouse, the humanitarian warehouse that is located in Panama. We do have essential supplies, vaccines, antidotes, etc. And Panama was so generous to let all those supplies go to any other country, even when they were facing uh, a huge problem. And that was the rules of engagement with Panama. And I think that's the, the type of commitment that we, we need to see everywhere. No, I think you're right, sir. And thanks for, for recognizing the role they played. And I know they've been uh, hugely generous and you know, sticking to your word is in any crisis, you build relationships by with people who stick to their words, stick to their commitments. That's been part of our problem in this response is getting everyone to stick to what they say they will do. Thank you. Young Me. So as I already mentioned, uh, to increase local uh, vaccine production capacity, first we need to uh, really um, invest more on the existing uh, vaccine manufacturer, uh, developing country vaccine manufacturing net network, uh, 
because as I mentioned, there are only 50 members out of 43 with the, which can produce the, uh, the, the high quality vaccines, which is uh, WHO pre-qualified. So we definitely need to uh, make this uh, network to the high, uh, high standard and we should fully utilize the, this uh, network. But in addition, because there is only one uh, member in, in African con continent. So we should obviously establish more, more members, more vaccine production sites in, in Africa. And this is the area I think we should all invest more. Um, and I think for the therapeutics and PPE and other medical product, we, we should really arrange similar mechanism uh, like this. And, um, and just lastly, I want to mention that, that um, we have discussed many things during the numerous webinar and many action points uh, came out. So those action points should be really implement, implemented, uh, I think, uh, by, by WHO and health partners and all countries. And also from the World Health Assembly and Global Health Summit, which will happen very soon, uh, those uh, the big events should not only address the, um, the idea of uh, sustained global solidarity and partnership, uh, how to prepare the future pandemics, but also engage in more urgent practical issues, um, action points that can be uh, uh, implemented by all countries and WHO and health partners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yang Mi. And uh, I would like to take these uh, recommendations from many mechanisms to WHO. And sometimes we refer to WHO as the secretariat of WHO. It is actually the member states who have the more, uh, the first and ultimate responsibility. And of course, the secretary has its role and responsibilities as well. So those recommendations must be addressed and implemented by who, whoever is being intended to. So for Michael Kramer, can, can you talk more about on, on a, who would make the investment in capacity, et cetera, and some the other investment uh, issues? Please, Michael. Yeah, let me, uh, let me echo uh, Mike's point about the bridge. That's uh, a great analogy. Uh, I think we need both global and national action. And um, the, at the national level, uh, let me start with the national level. I think there are going to be, first of all, let me note a huge difference between the COVID-19 and future pandemics. In COVID-19, you know, there were people who were concerned about, uh, about high-income countries or particular high-income countries, including my own, uh, buying up a lot of supply. And you know, the, the, in, the, in the short run, there are two possible effects of buying up that supply. Uh, well, first is the buying up supply. The other is you might incentivize construction of additional uh, supply. And so you have, to the extent you're buying up supply, you're hurting other countries in the world. To the extent you're incentivizing additional supply, you could be doing good things for the rest of the world. You know, it's, we'll never know the balance of those two things for COVID-19. That's because a general principle of economics uh, is that, sorry to be so, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, so much of a professor here, but uh, is that what's called elasticities of supply are much larger in the long run than the short run. In the short run, there's only so much you can do to increase supply. In the long run, there's typically a lot that can be done to increase supply. So while there is a potential trade-off between national interests and global interests in the, in the short run in a situation like COVID-19, if we switch to a pandemic preparedness uh, uh, framework, there's a, the, 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 you'll get the dominant thing. There's, we can construct enough capacity for the entire world. Um, and there's no, national investments are not bad. They can contribute. So if certain places, the US, the EU, China, wherever, want to spend a lot of money on this, India, whatever, that's great. Now, however, there are some very there are low income parts of the world that won't be able to make those investments. There, we need some sort of global solution. So may, uh, um, and you know, there's also a global public good element for all of the R&D and the R&D uh, should be supported uh, globally. Uh, but also we should welcome national efforts, but we need global efforts. And you know, let me end with this dose sharing. That's not something that would be of immense benefit to the whole world. I think we need some 
central support for that, not just, you know, Belgium's doing this trial, fantastic, but we need, uh, we need global support. Thank you so much for your comments, Michael. Uh, Mike, Jangmi, Michael, Amadou, it has been a, a great pleasure and a privilege to moderate your, uh, your interventions. Uh, and really, and, and thank, thanks also the National Academy of Medicine for organizing this, this event. Thank you so much. With this, we will conclude this panel. Thank you. Big hug to each of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.